Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I have the most wonderful job that I love so much. I offer one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. And if you're wondering what a typical day might look like for me, I might start off facilitating an angel session or a soul mentoring session. Then I might move on to teaching a class, which always takes place over Zoom, followed up with another angel session. So my days are lovely. Whenever I facilitate a session or a class, I get to bathe in the angelic energies with you. And so it is the sweetest way to connect and I love the work that I do so much, and it truly is a blessing to get to share it with you. So if you've never had an angel session before or joined one of my classes, but you're enjoying the energy and the vibe of this podcast, I invite you to explore my offerings. I'm really blessed that the work that I do is very intimate, so I get to meet you and get to know you and you get to know me. And so it's not as if you are lost in a sea of lots of other people. So I love getting to support you. And again, you can sign up for my mailing list on my website. I have two different mailing lists. The one at the top of my website will add you into my general mailing list. And then there's also a form further down the page, which will add you to my daily inspiration email blast. And then you'll receive not only the general announcements, but you'll also receive a daily inspiring email from me each day. So lots of ways we can connect. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you come into this beautiful, sweet sanctuary where you can receive and replenish. So a little bit about what you can expect from this episode. Each episode runs about an hour and it's not expected that you stay riveted and pay attention the whole hour. They're an hour long because as a listener of sleep podcasts, that is my preference because I'm not always asleep in 20 minutes. And so when I am listening to sleep podcasts as I drift off to sleep, I typically won't even consider listening to an episode that's less than 45 minutes. So my episodes will be almost an hour long, if not a little bit longer. There's two parts to each episode. This first part that we're in, where I share with you a little bit about what you can expect We'll talk about something on the spiritual path. I bring in the angels to be with you. So some people just listen to this part. The second part usually comes about 20 minutes in, sometimes 15 minutes in, and that's story time. And story time might be a story from my life. I might read to you something that's in the public domain. We might flip through an old cookbook or TV guide, and that lasts about 40 minutes. And some people just listen to the second part. (laughs) You might be one of the listeners that listens to the whole thing. 
however you choose to listen, you have my blessing and I am grateful for this time with you. And I will say this episode is one where I'm excited to get to story time because I have some lovely stories to share with you. So we'll get there. But for now, I want to help you come into a place where you can rest and receive. So I invite you to just take a breath in. You breathe all the time, but there's something about that beautiful, intentional breath in. At least for me, it helps me get centered. So just breathe in and breathe out. And I invite you to open to the love of your angels. Angels are divine celestial beings who embody unconditional love for us. The term unconditional love is sometimes hard to comprehend because we like to think as human beings, we can love unconditionally. And perhaps there are instances when we can, but in general, love is a polarity with us. We love some people, we don't love other people. We love some people and then we don't love them. So love is mutable when it comes to the human heart. But divine love, when we say unconditional love, I actually prefer the term divine love because it puts it into a different category. The best metaphor the angels have provided me for divine love is to contemplate the sun. It's not that the sun loves us, but the sun is ever present. The sun shines without prejudice. It is available in abundance. Even on a cloudy day, even during the night hours, we know the sun is there. It is there just sometimes. It is not visible to us. And we would never think that we are unworthy of the sun. We would never think that the sun is withholding from us. And divine love is that and so much more. That the angels have loved you since before you were born. They have been with you through every breath. There has never been a moment when this divine love has not been with you. It's just that we perceive ourselves as separate from it or disconnected from it. But it is always there, just like the moon. Those days or nights perhaps would be more accurate when we see just a sliver of the moon. The moon is not diminished. It is just that it is not illuminated in such a way that we have visibility to its wholeness. So this love, this love is ever present and it is here with you and for you. And it's not just here for some and not for others. It is here for every single one of us. Every molecule of this universe is loved. And whether you intellectually believe that, I invite you to imagine this is true, using your imagination as a gateway to open to conceptualizing things perhaps a bit differently in a more expansive way than you have before. I have found that adopting these concepts into my own life have created an overflow of goodness for me. That even when life feels sticky or hard, when I feel overwhelmed or sad or afraid, because I still feel all of those things because I'm a human being. There's this deep 
knowingness in me that I am cared for and loved through this experience. So I invite you to take another breath in. You've been breathing this whole time, I know, but just a lovely intentional breath in coming into your center and then just releasing, exhaling whatever it is you have been carrying that you do not want to carry. We all have something we can release on the exhale. Yes, (laughs) I do. So I'll take that breath with you. We'll breathe in. Oh, and just release whatever, whatever your, your gig is, whatever your stuff is, whatever has been feeling sticky or heavy or unwieldy. Just let it go for right now. And as you let it go, your angels are helping to bring to you a lightness of spirit. I love that phrase, lightness of spirit. It reminds me that we are not just human. We are divine beings in human form. And so when I think of lightness of spirit, when I ponder it, I feel my whole beingness being uplifted. And so, my beautiful friends, I want you to get comfortable in your body to the best of your ability. And you cozy on up and snuggle on in. And let the angels do the heavy lifting here. And I'm going to call them in to join us. They're already here. But I love sharing the ritual with you of asking them to be here. So I invite you to take another breath in and out as we gently call ourselves forward into the heart of God. And beautiful angels on high, we invite you to join us here. And we welcome you into this space as we are welcomed into this divine sanctuary with you. And angels, I ask that you make your presence known in ways that will inspire our hearts. I ask that you bring your love to each of our beloveds listening to this message. Help them to feel that they are cherished, that they are precious, and that they are a blessing in this world. And angels, I ask that you lift and clear from us anything that feels too heavy that is not ours. And I ask that you transform our worries into prayers for divine assistance. Knowing that things are transpiring, goodness is happening in service to each of our unique journeys here on this planet. And angels, I ask that you help clear from our physical bodies anything that does not serve us. And dear ones, just direct the angels to any places in your body where you could use some extra healing. Just allow the clearing, healing energy to flow to you. You can share your prayers and your intentions with the angels and they receive this from you and amplify your requests. There is such sweetness flowing to you right now. The angels want you to know that they are with you. They hear you. They have tremendous understanding and compassion about all that you are moving through. And they invite you into a place of faith. And if faith feels elusive for you, They will hold the faith for you.
And there is this lovely, happy, joyful energy flowing through that is present as your angels bring you into their hearts. They so appreciate this opportunity to love upon you right now. Goodness is flowing to you. New opportunities are taking place. Things are moving in your favor. Your angels are delighted by this opportunity to support you. So just open to feel their delight. They will loan some to you. They will share their joy with you. So again, just breathe and be and allow this love and joy to ripple through your beingness. Allow yourself to receive and we affirm you are replenishing. And if you are preparing for sleep, that this is a lovely time for you to rest and drift off. Your angels will be with you as they are always. And the angels and I will keep you company as we ramble and share stories and keep you company. So, my beautiful one, you rest well. And while you rest, I'm going to tell you a few stories. I want to share with you in this episode is some of my favorite places. Another way to say that is some of my happy places. There's a a very sweet book out right now that's very popular called Happy Place. And, or maybe it's Happy Places, I don't even know. I haven't read it yet. It's just the cover is very happy. And I was contemplating the other morning about some of my happy places, some of my favorite places that are no longer available to me. They no longer exist in the way they once did. And this happens to all of us, you know, with the blessing of a long lived life. We have lived through different eras, different relationships, different experiences. And there are places from my past that I miss. And I don't want this to sound really melancholy because that's not how I feel as I contemplate it. Instead, I feel wealthy. I feel so blessed that I've had so many places in my life that have nurtured me, that have loved me well, that have helped me create a matrix of loving and joy and goodness in my life. And it's not that I want to go back in time to who I was then or where I was then. I'm so grateful to be able to say that I have a deep contentment with where I am in life right now. I never thought I would say that. I've always been someone who strives for something else. But over the past year, I've gotten really clear that I am deeply contented with where I am right now. I don't have any big bright dreams on the horizon. I think it's because I'm living my dreams, right? There isn't some big milestone out there that I want to achieve. I would just love to keep 
doing what I'm doing. I, I love the vibration and the energy and the experience and the love that is in my life right now. Certainly there are things I would like to experience more of. I would love to have some other kinds of experiences, so I don't mean to make it sound like I am sated, right? Like I'm done. But when I was younger, I always wanted more. I wanted bigger. I wanted more. I wanted different. And these days I'm really contented. I'm like, I got it good. This is wonderful. So as I contemplate some of my favorite places in my life, these places helped me get to here. And so I'm so deeply grateful for that. So I'm going to share with you one of my most favorite places of my life. And that would be my parents' kitchen table and the whole house, right? So, so I don't mean to make it sound like it's just about the kitchen table, but for me, the kitchen table is a great metaphor for the love of my parents and of my family. We were very blessed to live in the same house for my entire life. My parents bought it, I think, in 1958, and we released it in 2019 after my mom had passed away. My father passed away in 2003, so it really was a foundation for our home. The kitchen table was always a gathering point, and it was the same kitchen table for my whole life. It was a white Formica table that you would have bought in the 50s. So it was white, and of course it had chairs around it. And when I was younger, we would all gather around the kitchen table for our meals. My father would sit on the inside corner. My father always positioned himself in the inside spot, wherever we were. I think because he knew as kids we wanted to run around and that was probably the easiest. And then I sat next to my dad and then my brother sat on the end of the table and then my mom and then my sister. So we always had our same spots at the table. And it was a small kitchen, so it's not as if, you know, it's not like the new open plan homes, you know, with the islands and everything else. It was a small kitchen, but we all fit around the table. And of course, my mom would cook for us. I don't mean to make it sound like everybody's mom's cooked, but my mom was definitely a housewife of the 50s and 60s and 70s, so she prepared our meals for us. But the thing that I really want to talk about about the kitchen table and why it's a place that I miss so much and one of my happy places and favorite places is my experience of it once I grew up and I moved to California and I would travel back fairly frequently to visit my family four times a year maybe as I got a little bit older, maybe it would be two times a year. And something you should know about me, I don't really like talking on the phone. Now, this may sound weird because so much of my business is based on the phone. I love doing angel sessions and mentoring sessions over the phone. So I don't want you to think that I actually do something I don't like to do. I love that part. The part that I'm not in love with these days is calling up a, a friend or a loved one and saying, how are you? And then having, you know, a half an hour conversation where we ramble through our lives. I don't enjoy that so much anymore. I love my people. So don't get me wrong. I love, love, love my people. 
but perhaps a way to say it is my social muscle has atrophied a bit. I find that I'm much more introverted when I'm not working. I once had a therapist share a fascinating term with me. And she said to me, she said, I think you're a noisy introvert. And I would have never thought of myself as introverted at the time. I said, no, I'm gregarious. I'm outgoing. She says, you are, but you replenish by going within. And of course, now I completely understand that. So I think what's happened over the years is that in my work, I am very extroverted and gregarious and I hold space for others and I love that. That's very authentic and genuine for me. And at the end of the day, I am delighted to go into my little bubble and Wes is part of my bubble. So don't worry. I don't, (laughs) I don't push him out, but I go into the introverted place, right? That place where I don't have to engage where I can just be and watch television or be on my iPad. I don't want to make it sound like I'm meditating and going into highly ascended places, but I get to go off the grid. And I think we all need that, right? So, so usually my time to talk on the phone and be social, not within my work day, but I mean, you know, as a friend or a family member, usually happens at the end of my day. And if you've been listening to this podcast at all, you know that I start winding down early. So talking on the phone socially, at least once I got into my 40s, was not my thing. And I'm going to come back to my parents' kitchen table. I promise this all weaves together. So I would talk to my mom all the time. And my mom was the communicator out of my parents, my dad, not so much. So I would talk to my mom and then my mom would fill my dad in on whatever we talked about. So as the years went on, my conversations with my mom over the phone would be somewhat lacking because of me, (laughs) right? We would call each other and I'd be like, Hey, what's going on? How are you? And she would tell me and then she'd say, how are you? You know, these regular conversations. And I'd be like, I'm good. I'm fine. And I would have no stories to fill in the space. Like that question, I don't ever know how to answer. Even with people I love, how are you? I'm good. And I realize I should have something to follow that up. But that doesn't work for me. I'm much more of an organic conversation person You know, if we were going out for lunch, we wouldn't just stop with, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. And then we wouldn't have anything else to say, right? We might talk about what are you going to order for lunch? What are you going to have? And that would lead us into other conversations. So I'm much more of an organic conversation person than someone who can make a phone call (laughs) really meaningful on a regular basis. I don't know if this is making any sense to you. I'm I'm just laughing within myself because it feels so complicated in here inside of me. So, so anyways, the point being (laughs) that I would have a lot of these conversations with my mom. How are you? I'm good. What's new? Nothing much. And, And it's not that I wanted to withhold from her, but that kind of engagement always feel stilted to me. So I would try to bring things up for her so I could share them with her. And and I always would kind of feel badly because it wasn't easy for me, even though I could talk to my mom about anything. But so here's where the kitchen table comes back. I promise we get back to this. So when I would fly home to Chicago, to Skokie to be more accurate, I would come in the door, of course, and we would have a long hug and we might sit in the living room for a little while and talk. But at some point, no matter what time of the night I got in, because I usually came in in the nighttime, we would find ourselves at the kitchen table 
My mom would have asked, do you want something to eat? Because she's a good Jewish mom. And she would have had something there that I would have liked because she would always ask me what I wanted. And so she would get what I wanted and then more. And so we would sit at the kitchen table and I would be having some sort of snack or meal, or if you're Jewish, a nosh, some nosh, a little nosh or I. And then we would talk. And it was these conversations at the kitchen table where I could pour my heart out about whatever I wanted to share because it wasn't this confined conversation on the phone where I had this very, I don't know, um, manufactured window to share something. We would wander in and out of conversation. There is something about wandering in and out of conversation that is so beautiful that I don't necessarily get from a phone call. But that's just me. It might work for you. So I would look forward to those moments around the kitchen table with my mom. Because by this point, my father had passed. He passed in 2003. I'd already shared that with you. So it was these moments with my mom around the kitchen table any time of the day or night. And when I was visiting her, we would have multiple times around the table where we would just sit and talk. And wander through conversations and the kitchen table was always a sanctuary for me. It was a place where I could sort through the different pieces of my life and life would seem to make sense again. I was always loved at that table. That table to me represented stability and love. And whoever I was at that table, I was always accepted. And I don't, I don't even know that I should say understood because I think that I was definitely a paradox of sorts to my parents. I think as any good child is, yes, <laughs> we, we challenge our parents as we grow and evolve. But that kitchen table was a constant throughout my life. Throughout my life, I was a baby at that table. I was a toddler at that table. I was a kid at that table. I was a sullen adolescent at that table. The table is where we sat down when I met Wes and I brought Wes home to meet my mom and he sat at the table with us and delighted my mom that she could feed him food that he enjoyed that was simple. <laughs> my, my, my husband can be a very simple guy. A piece of matzah, he was happy. Some oatmeal, he was happy. And my mom fell in love with Wes at that table. She thought Wes hung the moon. She, Whenever I told her I was coming to visit her, she'd go, that's great. And is Wes coming? She, she genuinely loved, loves still Wes. He hung the moon as far as she was concerned. And so, so much of my life was witnessed at that table. I love that kitchen table and I love that time there with my parents. And that is one of my favorite places of my life. And, you know, when you say, I would give anything to go back there again. I don't know that that's really true. I, I don't know. I think I don't uh, know that I want to go back anywhere in my life. Because where I am right now is beautiful. And what would I trade for that? But... I do miss it. I 
I'd love to have another opportunity to sit around the table with my parents. And I do that in my heart. I think that's the other blessing of life is that these favorite places, these experiences dwell within us. So in my mind's eye, in my heart, it's so easy for me to go back to that table and hear the way the chair would scrape on the tile and the sound it would make and that there were always the newspapers ready to be read against the corner and there was this little acrylic napkin holder either my brother or sister made in shop I say that because I know it wasn't me so one of my siblings made that always had the little napkins in it and there were catalogs usually on the table that my mom would flip through while she ate her lunch and the kitchen table to me for the rest of my life will represent one of my happy places and one of my favorite places to be in this lifetime. Okay, so so that's the first one. I wasn't sure how long that was going to take, so I thought maybe that's going to be a whole episode, but I don't think, I think we're good. I'm going to probably at some point do a whole episode about our house um, that I grew up in, but for now I will leave you with the kitchen table. And there's a beautiful book by Rachel Naomi Remen called Kitchen Table Wisdom, which is just beautiful. And so I love the title of the book and I love what she wrote about. And so this is my version of Kitchen Table Wisdom and how it continues to dwell within my heart. Thanks to my beautiful parents. Another one of my favorite places or happy places that I want to share about that I've shared with you before is when I lived in this beautiful duplex with my cousin Susie, who listens to the podcast. So hi, Bleedin. We call each other Bleedin. So hi, Bleedin. She's Susie Bleedin. So um, hi. And this duplex that we lived in is absolutely one of my favorite places that I have experienced in my life. So we had both broken up with people and we got to talking one day and we said, you know what? We should live together and we should get dogs. That was our solution to to everything. Let's live together and we're going to get dogs. And we started looking for a place. I had my own one bedroom at that time, but certainly living with Susie and getting dogs sounded amazing. And we figured we could probably get a duplex. So I don't know if duplexes like this are common around the country or around the world, but in Los Angeles, there is this form of architecture that became very popular called duplexes, and they were almost always Spanish style. And there were two huge units, and they would have fireplaces and curved doorways and art deco tile in the bathrooms. They were really beautiful, and we wanted to get a duplex. So we found one and we got it. It was on the second floor. It was near Beverly Hills called Beverly Hills Adjacent is the neighborhood. And I'm not trying to sound snooty there. It's just, it was just a few blocks out of Beverly Hills. And it was magnificent. I don't know exactly how big it was, but it had a formal dining room. It had like two and a half bedrooms, one and a half bathrooms, a fireplace. It was magnificent. And we were in our younger years at that point, and we did wind up both getting dogs. I got my dog Tessa, and Susie got her dog Mike. And we were very social at that age. 
And so we would throw dinner parties and have friends over. And it wasn't uncommon to have friends over to watch our favorite television show. You know, Netflix wasn't really a thing yet. So whatever show we loved, we might have friends over. And it was a very social, joyful time. And we had friends who lived nearby. So there were always friends coming and going. And we traveled in packs, right? So if we wanted to go out for dinner, there might be, you know, anywhere between five and 10 people who would go and meet with us. And I just remember that as a profoundly fulfilling and happy time. And so I miss that. And her dad lived nearby, so her dad would always come over as well, and and her mom too. And it was really beautiful. And I miss that. I miss that place. I miss that access to each other and to our friends and to the joy of planning a dinner party together and having people over. And it's not that I want to go back there because the me that I was then, as happy as I was, I felt rather lost. I didn't love my job. I hadn't found my person yet. I didn't know who I was going to be when I grew up. I mean, I was living this really wonderful life, but my inner world felt at odds with who I was, if that makes sense. You know, our our inner world sometimes is not really visible on the outside. And so I was kind of waiting for life to happen. I was waiting to meet my man. I was waiting to find my way into the work that was going to just light me up. I had a really good job and I enjoyed it. And I worked with friends. I worked for a home video company at the time. So it's not as if my job sucked, but I was like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I was still really at odds with my body and being a heavier girl and all of that stuff. So I don't want to paint it as too idealistic, but I think the amazing thing about our consciousness, at least mine does, is I typically hold on to the good And I let go of the stuff that wasn't so good. And so when I think about that time living with Susie in the duplex, I just really feel the happiness of that time. There's a wonderful book called, I think it's What My Life with My Dogs Has Taught Me by Meryl Marco. And Susie had gotten the book and we sat outside on our little porch and we were reading it out loud, laughing so hard we couldn't breathe because it was so funny. And that to me crystallizes what our time living together felt like. It seemed like we laughed a lot. (laughs) We laughed a lot. And it was a shared life. It was shared experience. And there was a lot of love and friendship and community that happened there. And and so that's one of my favorite places. I loved the access we had to our friends. We were really surrounded by lots of wonderful people. And it was it was really one of the bright spots of my life, for sure. So if you're listening to this, bleed in. I'm so glad that we got to have that experience together because it continues to bring me joy all of these years later. And if you're wondering what happened, um, life moved on, um, life moved on (laughs) and, and we had to leave that part of our life behind and move on to other adventures, which, which were not easy adventures, I will say. So I'm glad we had that time that was really beautiful and joyful and sweet 
So that's another one of my favorite places, our happy places. So when I think about it, it really makes me happy. I'll even say one of my, it's so weird that I'm going to say this, <laughs> you'll understand in a moment. When I moved back from New York, it was 95 or 96, and I, I wasn't happy in New York, and so I came back and I had to find an apartment, and Susie was helping me with it because we had this method of driving up and down all the streets where we wanted to live. And then you would write down the phone numbers on the signs outside of the apartments to look for somewhere to live. And I was looking for a place that would take me and take my dog. And we were having a hard time finding places that fit within my budget and that would take the dog. And we were exhausted. We had been looking for several days already. And... I was still living in New York at that time, so I had just come out to look for apartments. And we drove down this one street, and there was this very unattractive, nondescript building. And there's a sign out front, and this old man sitting next to the sign. And I didn't want to look at it. It wasn't cute. I wanted a cute place. I, I had lived in a duplex. And my place in New York was adorable. And I wanted a really cute place. And Susie said, let's just look at it. And I was like, okay. It was this short squat building, even though it was a two-story building. And it had blue pool tile on the front. So very much like 60s construction thing. It was a first floor unit. It was a two-bedroom, one-bath. And... There was really nothing interesting about it. A very ordinary apartment. But the price was right, and they would take my dog, and there was like crown molding or something up at the ceiling. And I thought, okay, you know what? I'll make this work. I don't have to live here forever. I'm going to just make it work. And I took the apartment because they would rent to me. And I just wanted it to be over, right? And I think Susie did too. We'd been doing this for days. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take it. <laughs> Let's do this. And then we went and got Manny Petties. We're like, we deserve Manny Petties. Let's go. <laughs> Let's splurge. And so it's so weird to me to say that that is one of my favorite places because I never liked the apartment. I wound up living there until I moved up here to Vallejo in 2008. So I lived there a really long time. And I really didn't like the apartment. I was almost always unhappy with it. But it was a lovely place, which sounds like a real paradox. So I made the apartment my own. I had my beautiful sofa, my floral slip covered shabby chic sofa in there and my pine furniture. I was very 90s and loved it. And there was a lot of love that happened in that apartment. My bedroom wall was painted this beautiful faux orange Tuscan. I had an artist come in and do it for me and it was gorgeous. And so even though I didn't really like the apartment itself, the apartment held a big space for me. My cousin Joe, Susie's dad, lived around the block from me, so I would get to see him fairly frequently. And then Susie wound up getting an adorable apartment a few blocks away from me, so she would be in the same neighborhood. And then our friends Kirsten and Bruce, who had moved to San Francisco, wound up living across the street from me in a fourplex. And so I was surrounded by people I loved and who loved me. And so, again, that apartment lent itself to community and to friendship and to family. And then when I started Illuminating Souls, I worked out of that apartment and I started my first in-person groups there. 
So for several years, I facilitated this wonderful Monday night group. It started off as a spiritually based writers group, and then it evolved into mystical ascension and this very magical group of people that I still can't get over that I had the honor and blessing of mentoring. Like, how did that even happen? Would come to my living room once a week and sit on the couch and the chairs and we would write and read our writing to each other and share what was going on in our lives and do ceremony together. And it was remarkable. I still can't get over that that magic happened in my life. I loved my Monday group so much. And it, it was one of those magical times that I don't know will ever happen again. You know, it's, it was one of those kismet moments. And it lasted for a few years and and people would wander in and out of the group. You know, some people stayed the whole time. Other people would come for a few months and then leave and then come back again. But it was, it was a place where we came together in this love and I got to facilitate this group and I had just started my business. So it felt like I hit it out of the park, you know, my first time at bat. And then I had a second group that met over the phone on Tuesdays. And it was very similar. And again, that group happened for a couple of years. They stayed together and again, hit it out of the park again. And I taught that class from the second bedroom, which became my office. So that apartment, as much as I didn't like it, a lot of love happened there and I learned who I was there. I went through USM from that apartment and when I first met Wes, I had that apartment and that's where he would come and visit me. And I remember very early on in our relationship, maybe it was the second time he came to visit me because he lived in Northern California. He came down and he had this big bag and he starts taking these big crystals out of this bag and placing them around my apartment. And I said, what are you doing? He said, this way, you know, I'm coming back. (laughs) Is that the sweetest thing ever? Because I always was afraid that maybe this wasn't going to work. Like I knew he was my person. I, I knew he was my person, but I didn't yet have the faith that he knew I was his person. So he would do things like that. So he's like, you know, I'm coming back. And, um, I said goodbye to my dog Tessa in that apartment. And that was the apartment I was in the year that my father was dying. And then I also in some ways gave birth to myself through USM in that apartment. So that apartment held a huge space for me throughout profoundly important times in my life. And there was, um, towards the end, like back in 2005 and 2006, I had a lot of optimism and hope in that apartment because those were the years when I was really manifesting, manifesting Wes, manifesting illuminating souls. Like, what am I going to be when I grow up and I'm discovering who I am and I'm in love with my life and I'm in love with myself. And there was a real optimism, even though I was terrified like, please let this work. Please let this happen. All took place in that apartment. So it's so interesting to me that that's one of my happy places, one of my favorite places, even though 
I never really liked the apartment. And also I was very unhappy in my life for that apartment as well, right? Because I went through deep unhappiness within myself that ultimately led me to go to USM. So, so I don't want to make it all, sound all bright and shiny, but again, how things dwell within me, I remember the happy spaces in that apartment. I remember sitting around my kitchen table or my dining room table, I guess, because I didn't, it was the only table with my girlfriends and we would do oracle card readings for each other. And two of my friends in particular, who I thought were so open psychically would say, oh my God, you can totally do this work. You have no idea who you are, but you're incredibly powerful. And I was like, no, this is before I knew about my gifts. And I remember my one friend in particular, she's like, you have no idea. You're incredibly powerful. And I thought, no, but we would sit around and with my other friends, we would, you know, pull our Oracle cards and have cake. It was so joyful. It was so sweet. And we would try to figure out our lives. So it's interesting to me that apartment even though I went through a lot of hardship within myself and in my life in that apartment, it dwells in me as one of my happy places and one of my favorite places where so much of my life happened. So many profound, key, joyful moments in my life took place there. So, those are three of my favorite places, three of my happy places. The kitchen table, my parents' house, the beautiful duplex that I got to share with my cousin Susie, and then the apartment I had for the last over 10 years that I lived in Los Angeles. And I think, honestly, it's one of those blessings for me about growing older is I really don't have a lot of regret or remorse. I have had the blessing and I continue to have the blessing of living a very lovely life. I've lived a lot of life. I have experienced so many of the things I wanted to experience in this life. And certainly one of my favorite places is where I am now with my husband, for sure. <laughs> I'm so contented in our life right now, honestly. I'm delighted with our life right now. It is so sweet and so nurturing. And, and this is for sure one of my favorite places. So, so that's a story for another day. So I have more favorite places to share with you for sure. And maybe this will help you contemplate some of your favorite places that no longer exist, right? Those, those times in my life are past and that's okay. It, it, it's like life moves on. That's the nature of life is it doesn't stay static. And my hope for you is there are places on your timeline that when you revisit them, they bring you joy. Because I believe that time doesn't have to be linear. Those moments around the table with my mom, that love is still here with me. The joy of being in the duplex with Susie and our dogs, that joy and that love is still with me all of the beautiful experiences that I had in my apartment. It's still with me just because they're no longer available to me in physical world reality doesn't mean they don't still exist. They exist within me. I can touch them. I can feel the table under my fingertips. I can see the light coming in through the window. They still exist and they still replenish me. And so 
I'm so grateful to be able to share this with you and put this into my treasure chest of memories. And I hope that this is a catalyst for you to remember some of your favorite places too. So thank you again for giving me the honor of sharing these pieces of my life with you. I love you very much and I wish you the sweetest of dreams. Thank you.